Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Forage Funds Investors Webinar regarding fund performance. I'm Alex Larkman, and I'm the Business Development Manager of Forager Funds. Today's presentation will be led by Steve Johnson, who's the Chief Investment Officer of Forager, and he'll be joined by Alex Shevelev, who's Senior Analyst on the Forager Australian Fund, and Gareth Brown, who's the Senior Analyst of the Forager International Fund. Today's presentation will be approximately 40 minutes, and then there'll be a Q&A session at the end. So the total time of this webinar will be approximately one hour. You can type your questions at any time in the Q&A box and we will endeavour to answer those at the end. And just to let you know that the session today will be recorded. So some important information for you before we start. Anything you hear today is general in advice in nature only and doesn't take your personal situation into account. And now I'll hand over to Steve. Thank you, Alex, and welcome everyone. Uh, there are no security guards at the door, but the aim of today's webinar is to provide everyone with a bit of an update on the funds. Uh, we've been getting a number of queries from clients, for the, the vast majority of them well-founded, uh, legitimate concerns with what's been going on with the funds, and we just thought we'd provide a forum with which we can address some of those concerns to the whole investor base and allow you to ask some questions as well and us to answer those. So the focus of today's presentation is going to be the, the poor performance of both funds over the past year, uh, an explanation for external and internal factors contributing to that bad performance, and then a focus towards the back end of the presentation on, on what we're doing about it and some views around what we see as the future for both funds. So I'll kick off with the Australian Fund. Uh, I'll talk a bit about the past couple of years and then Alex Chevrolet is going to come in and talk a bit about the current portfolio and we'll move on to the International Fund after that. So this first slide here is just a summary of the performance to the end of 31 March. And it really has been a horrible 15 months in terms of our performance in relation to the units. The NTA peaked in January last year. As you can see, the performance has been very bad over the past year. And that's both relative and absolute. And from our perspective, the, the absolute performance is, is something that concerns us more than the relative performance, particularly in a market like this that has been quite strong. Although the long-term performance is still well ahead of the market, the past year has been so bad that it's put a significant dent in the three and five year numbers. So what's causing this poor performance? Well, first I wanna to touch on a couple of external factors. Uh, this has been a horrible market for value investors. This is not gonna give you any comfort and I wanna be really clear, it's not an excuse. But the gap between growth stock valuation and value stock valuation is as wide as it has ever been. Uh, just as a quick example, I looked up this morning the market cap of JB Hi-Fi at a bit less than $3 billion uh, with its 200 million a year of annual profits is less than half of that of the yet to be profitable after pay. And I think we don't own either of those stocks, but it is a clear uh, sign of the divergence that we've seen in the market between those businesses that are seen as growing and are attracting what I would call extraordinary valuations and those that are not, which are tending to attract, to attract much more attractive valuations. Again, this is not an excuse for us losing money. It is a suggestion that perhaps some of the market returns are a mirage. And the longer it goes on, this tends to feed on itself. In recent months, we've seen a number of meaningful value funds suffering redemptions, uh, a lot of cross ownership with us in our portfolio there. So we're seeing some of the transactions take place and that tends to force performance down further. Second factor is that we've held too much cash. Now, I've said from the day that we started this fund that most of the, of the time we wanna be mostly invested. And I specifically stated that that means we want to be more than 80% invested more than eight years in 10. And particularly over the last five years, we haven't delivered on that objective. Australian 10 year bonds are currently yielding about 1.7% per annum. At those sorts of levels of return on government bonds and cash, I'm very confident that equities are going to generate better returns over the coming decade as they have over the past one. We cannot afford to be sitting on huge piles of cash for large parts of that period. I'll come to some of the organisational changes over the past few years later in the presentation, but one last point on cash. Aside from the performance drag, I do think large cash weightings have a tendency to encourage more risk in the rest of the portfolio. 
while hard to specifically identify, there's a good chance it contributed to some of our mistakes over the past few years. And then onto the actual contribution over the past year. This is a slide that shows the makeup of that minus 10% for the 12 months to the end of 31 March. Uh, you can see down the bottom of that chart, Freedom Insurance is on its own more than 6% of the negative 10% performance has been a very significant contributor to the negative performance. I'm not going to dwell too much on that one specific stock today. We've written a lot about it in recent quarterly reports and frankly, it is time to move on and get on with building the right portfolio for today. But I do want to touch on something that I think has been important, not just for Freedom, but for Thorn Group, another of the holdings in our portfolio as well. I think the key risk that we underestimated here, which is a change in the regulatory environment, is something that has been a bit of a wider mistake across the portfolio. We were too slow to adjust to an environment where protecting consumers has been, become a regulatory and a government priority. I should that add that from a consumer perspective, it's about time. Uh, we spent a lot of years at Intelligent Investor and on our blog being very alarmed and upset about the quality of some of the products that were being sold to consumers out there. Uh, but my scepticism about the willingness of the authorities to actually take action has proved very expensive over the past 12 to 18 months. Also on this slide, you can see it's a long tail of negative contributions and there are not many on the positive side. Whilst there are a few businesses that have underperformed our expectations, there are a lot of those negative contributors where the business case is largely on track. So we've seen significant negative market moves in that value part of the equation. And we haven't seen in this past 12 months the offsetting big winners that we've had in previous years. Uh, that's an important part of our philosophy. We tend to end up with lumpy returns. We tend to end up with multi-baggers on the positive side of the ledger, as well as the odd big loss. And that has been conspicuously absent over the past few years. I'll bring Alex Shevelev in now to talk about where a few of those winners might come from in future. Thanks, Steve. So I'll talk about some of the portfolio. As you can see on the slide there, the top 10 positions currently in the portfolio. Now the three largest there, that's Aniro, McMahon and iSelect, they total about 26% of the portfolio. So these are gonna be crucial to the next six to 12 months returns. And we'll talk about two of these in a little bit more detail in a couple of slides time. There's, uh, there's some exposures that are not in this portfolio. So we have very minimal exposure to housing and consumer spending. And then there are some exposures like oil and gas services that are about 9% of this portfolio and they've caused a drag in that last 12 months. One of those MMA offshore, you can see there is the fourth largest position. Cash level, Steve has discussed, it's about 27% at the moment. There'll be some ideas that will be exiting the portfolio, they're towards the end of the, their time in the fund, so we're in harvesting mode to some. But on the other side of that, uh, we've added three new investments in the last four months to that portfolio. And it's come from a watch list of investment opportunities that because of that underperformance of value has grown. And also on top of that, our, uh, the number of stocks that are close to giving us a margin of safety has also increased. So while we've acted on only three of them, there are more than 50 still sitting on that watch list that have already had work done them where we're, on them where we're ready to act when the price presents an opportunity. So we'll discuss two portfolio, two portfolio investments that have had uh, some pleasing results over the last little while. The first of these is Aniro. So Aniro has been in the fund uh, almost since inception. It's a marketing services business that owns a portfolio of companies in Australia, the UK and the US. The company trades on about nine times earnings and is paying consistent dividends. It's a people business that's been growing quite well. You may have seen Steve's blog post on these businesses. As the uh, momentum inside the business builds, people are enthusiastic, they're bidding for work, and that tends to lead to better organic growth continuing. The share price here is up about 40% over the last year, but the earnings from that growth that we've seen over the last year are up about 90% for the half. The business also has a tailwind from owning a tech 
uh, public relations firm in the US and UK called Hotwire. And as you can understand, there'd be quite a bit of uh, demand for that sort of work at the moment. They've also been making some sensible and complementary acquisitions and putting them into the general group. So we're quite confident that that business will continue growing. And as mentioned, it's trading on something like nine times earnings still. The second of the three largest investments that we'll talk about today is Isolate. So it's a comparison website for health insurance, for telco and for energy services. Now, importantly, it encourages competition in this space and specifically in health insurance. Smaller insurers like NIB have this platform to compete with the larger insurers like your Medibanks and Boopers. They deal with customers that come to the company, that come to Isolate for a better deal. Now, the business model does have uh, a product provider uh, focus. So those product providers will pay iSelect for sales and that can cause some conflicts. So these are important considerations, but iSelect is a proven business model in Australia as this model has been proven around the world. It's a dominant player in this space and it is a key channel for a significant number of the smaller insurers that want to get their product to market. At the moment, Isolate's trading on about eight times earnings with a net asset backing of about 49 cents per share. New management entered about this time last year, which is about where we were buying our holding at below 50 cents per share. And they have cleaned up and effectively controlled the marketing expenditure of this business and other operating costs. That's a very important cost. And as such, the profit rose something like 73% for the most recent half. Important to note here that their, most, uh, their largest domestic competitor, Compare the Market, was actually buying around the same time and now owns about 23% of the business. Any synergies in a merger of these two businesses could be quite significant. I'll touch as well about on two new investments in the fund. One of these is car sales. Now, this is a good balance for some of the other stocks in the portfolio, the liquid or the more cyclical. It is Australia's leading online used car uh, site. It connects dealers and it connects private sellers with buyers. The business has a powerful network effect. And just to highlight this, six years ago, you, if you're buying a used car, would be going to about four dealers. Now a lot of that effort has moved online and the average buyer of a used car is only going in to 1.8 dealers. The share price towards the end of last year fell on concerns of new car sales, on, concern, on broader market concerns and some of the asset concerns on a small subsidiary. We thought this was an attractive entry price into this very high quality business, probably the highest quality business that has uh, been in the portfolio. It has a long-term growth prospects and optionality with offshore investments such as their investment in a similar business in Korea. Another is Experience Co. So this company uh, is a bit more uh, consistent with what the fund has been doing historically, but it is a quality business at heart. So Experience Co. operates skydiving activities in Australia and New Zealand, and some adventure activities, think whitewater rafting or trips out to the Barrier Reef. This is a former market darling. You've seen the share price collapse dramatically, more than 80%, and there was a series of earnings downgrades due to weather and due to some poor acquisitions they made in their adventure segment. Now, that adventure segment is not going to match the expectations of management before, uh, that, uh, before those acquisitions, but it's also not a write-off. It's a medium quality business, but we think it has some value. Meanwhile, the skydiving business is the real quality gem here. Despite those slow, that slower growth due to a series of unfortunate fatalities and due to some weather impacts, the volume, the number of jumpers here has grown by more than 7% for 15 years. If you're jumping out of an airplane, you're going skydiving, the chances are more than seven out of 10 that you're jumping out of an experienced co, uh, an experienced co-plane. So very high market share in what looks to be a continually growing market. New management came in approximately the time we were buying in this one as well, and they've done a good job of tidying up the business 
and restoring confidence while improving disclosure. So I'll hand back to Steve here. Just one final point on the portfolio here. While the value space is performing woefully, if our companies were making profits and paying dividends, we would be far less concerned about the share prices. <coughs> When we run this portfolio as a whole, it's currently trading at a huge discount to book value at the moment, but too many of them aren't doing enough to realize that value for shareholders. And Thorn Group is a perfect example. This business has well north of a dollar in very tangible, fairly short-term assets sitting on its balance sheet, and it's currently trading at 40-something cents because it hasn't made a return on those assets for many years. The management and the board need to do more to extract the value out of this company, and we're working very hard to make that happen. And we need to do more of this across the portfolio over the coming years. So we've had some early success, uh, particularly with Logicams, which uh, has, has now in the process of merging with an unlisted company called OSD, which is going to build, bring an attractive owner manager mentality to that business. And behind the scenes, we've made some good progress with software company MSL Solutions. Thorn is still the big one for the rest of this year and there is more in the portfolio that needs some action. We need to do more to extract it. We also need to give a lot more thought to these illiquid situations that aren't currently performing well. If there are problems that we know need to be fixed, we need to enter these situations with a plan about how we're going to fix them before getting stuck in small and illiquid stocks. And finally, on the Australian Fund, I do want to address this issue around the traded price of the vehicle. Anyone who's come to one of our roadshows over the past few years uh, will have heard me express concern about the premium that the units were trading at on the ASX. You can see in the chart on the right hand side here that that premium that was very significant less than a year ago is now a discount to NTA. And the traded price, while the NTA might, uh, performance has been minus 10% over the past year, the traded price has fallen by a lot further. You can see in the left hand chart that fall is partly distribution. We distributed 21 cents at 30 June last year. It's partly performance, 23 cents of that fall is performance, but there's also another 21 cents there that is the premium falling to a discount over the, the course of the past year. I said I was uncomfortable with the premium that was trading at. We certainly don't want to see this vehicle trading at a big discount for extended periods of time as well, but our actions are going to be the same as they've been since we listed. We set this vehicle up with a cost structure that was low enough to make it competitive with an unlisted fund, and that has not changed. We are still actively working to create a public profile for the, for the fund to ensure an active market in the securities. We have a transparent and informed market through the daily publishing of NTA. In hindsight, we certainly think that was the right call. And then the first, fourth really important factor, and it's obviously the main factor contributing to the discount today, is the performance. And that's what we've spoken about and what we're currently working very hard to address. Moving across now to the International Fund. We've had a few of the same problems in this fund, but perhaps a bit more going right. First up, a review of the performance. The International Fund is roughly flat over the past 12 months versus an index that's up 10. And in contrast with the Australian Fund, the longer term performance numbers are also less than the index. I'll deal with a couple of the external issues first. And I think in this fund, those external issues are probably more relevant than they are with the Australian fund. Firstly, we've had this same factor at play that value globally has been dramatically underperforming as it has here in Australia. You can see on this chart, it's 4% less over the past year. It's significantly more than that if you look back over a five year period. More influential on our portfolio returns is the fact that the US has been the main driver of global index returns over the past five years. You can see on the left hand side of this chart, US stocks have returned a compound annual return of almost 16% per annum over the past five years. If you take the US out of the rest of the world market, that number has been closer to eight and you can see much closer to our uh, fund returns there. Now, a little bit like the Australian fund, this is not an excuse. We obviously have the US as an option to invest the fund's money in, but the large majority of the investing we've done over the past five years has been outside the US due to a combination of a lack of experience and expertise there and the perceived value that Gareth is about to talk about in, in other parts of the world. 
On the specific, on the cash weighting, we've done uh, a lot of investing over the past couple of years and you can see that that cash weighting since June 2017 has come down quite significantly. Uh, I'm very happy with that progress over the past couple of years. Uh, I still think it was a mistake for us to end up where we ended up two years ago and we want to work in future on making sure that we are better prepared for the realisation of some of our investments and to redeploy that money elsewhere quickly rather than letting that process take too long. Over the life of this fund, that cash weighting has been a very, very significant drag on performance. On the stock specific side of things, it has been more of a, a mixed bag in the international fund. Gareth's going to talk about a couple of our uh, investments that are going very well in this portfolio. And when you think about that value growth dichotomy, there are a few more businesses in this portfolio that I would put in the, the growth category, i.e. the good business is growing quickly and we have benefited from those tailwinds in that space. And also a couple of businesses that are just delivering some exceptional results. On the negative side of the ledger, the largest there is Just Group. This is a UK annuities <coughs> provider. The actual underlying business has been performing better than our expectations. Uh, sales are up quite significantly and profitability is up quite significantly. The company has been caught up in, a, in some regulatory changes that have forced it to hold significantly more capital against its annuity business. And that has diluted shareholders and caused the share price to more than half over the past 12 months and it's been a significant negative contributor for us. Uh, you can see a, a number of UK stocks there that have performed poorly, uh, with general pessimism about that market and our exposure to oil and gas, it was a big positive contributor in the prior year over the past 12 months, it's contributed a fairly significant negative number. Uh, the oil price itself was off a lot leading up to Christmas last year and has since recovered but the oil services stocks have not yet recovered with it. As I touched on, there's a few more things going right in this portfolio and a lower cash weighting. And I'll bring Gareth Brown in now to talk about the current portfolio. Thanks, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in front of you, there is, is a, there is a slide showing the International Fund's uh, top 10 current positions. And I'd like to start with a few important points. There are currently six stocks in our portfolio that make up more than 5% of fund assets each. And this is about where we want to be on average. This is a concentrated portfolio by design and that brings all the opportunities and risks uh, that come with that. And I think it's an important thing to, um, to keep in mind as an investor in this fund. You're not buying an index fund here. That concentration carries over into geographical diversity. As you can see on that list, four of our 10 largest positions at the moment are listed in the UK and another four are in continental Europe. So we've got eight out of 10 focused on wider Europe. Now I should point out that about half of those companies themselves have broad international diversification in terms of their sales rather than a domestic focus. But we're clearly concentrated on Europe and the UK at the moment. Now we go where the opportunities are. We think UK and Europe hold the best opportunities in the developed world at the moment. That's hurt our relative performance lately, but we do believe it will pay off over time. Asia is another place of potential opportunity for us, but it's one that we've been treading very cautiously over the last few years. Uh, we've recently appointed Paul Kwa to the team and he brings significant Asian experience. So we expect to see a few Asian names in this top 10 list uh, over the next year or two. We are working towards broader geographic exposure, but we will never do it at the expense of value. Moving on, there's now also minimal exposure to the mega caps that played a really important role uh, in, this, in the early days of the fund. We do still own Alphabet, that's the company that owns the Google search engine, and I hope we own that one for many years but most of the portfolio is now clearly focused on small and medium capitalization stocks. And that's where we see our sweet spot. You should expect that to continue. Uh, as Steve pointed out, cash has been down over the last few years. It's actually risen a little bit in, in recent months as we've taken profits on a few of the ideas that have come to full fruition. Uh, but our idea generation pipeline is looking good and that cash balance, I would suggest, is more likely to shrink a little over the coming months than to rise. Let's now take a look at a couple of stocks. Uh, Blanco Technology Group is a global leader in paid erasure software. 
which is used to safely clear a hard drive before a computing device is resold, recycled or trashed. The fund bought most of its position in this stock in late 2017 in the midst of what can only be described as sheer panic. There was a lot of blind selling and very little in the way of interested buyers. We outlined our thesis more fully in last year's roadshow and you can find a full recording of that on our YouTube channel. But in short, that panic has now subsided uh, and the stock price has more than doubled uh, over the following 18 months as Blanco has hit some important milestones. Firstly, the company appointed a high caliber CEO and CFO to write the financials and refocus this business on the things that matter, which is sales and product development. Revenue has returned to growth. In the latest half year period, sales were up 19% on the same period the year earlier. And the business has also returned to meagre profit and free cash flow generation. And this is in despite heavy investment focus on long-term growth. And we're seeing a lot of what we refer to as pain today, gain tomorrow type behavior from management. These are actions that impinge reporter results today that grow the pie for tomorrow. So things have normalized and the stock market has clearly recognized a lot of that. But we think this is a business that can grow revenue significantly over the next five years and more. 15% per year revenue growth is about our base expectation. And we ex also expect margins to grow sharply. So earnings per share should grow really quite rapidly, although from a very low base today. The stock is currently trading around £1.20. Our base case valuation is around £2.00 and our upside valuation is north of three pounds. This is a stock that may well become an acquisition in the fullness of time. And that's actually likely to be the end game here, but we, we actually hope it doesn't happen too soon. We want the business to grow and sort out some of its issues first so we can get a higher price. And thanks to significant share price appreciation, Blanco is a nine and a half percent position today. That's the biggest single weighting in the history of the international fund. Now this is a small illiquid stock and you should steal yourself for significant share price volatility. But we're very happy with the business's progress and we don't want to let this one go too cheaply. Let's move on to another stock now, one that we've been selling down lately. Auto Trader is the UK's dominant portal for used car sales, with most of its revenue coming from car dealerships rather than private sellers. It's a business of unusual quality that can grow without retaining any capital. This is a very rare attribute in the business world. The fund bought its position about 12 months ago uh, and it was clearly a baby being thrown out with the Brexit bathwater. The investment case was outlined uh, in more detail in the March 2018 quarterly report, but the short thesis is that we bought a high quality grower here on an initial free cash flow yield of almost 6%. Now effectively all of that 6% percent to be returned to shareholders each year in the form of buybacks and dividends. While we expected revenues and profits to grow in the vicinity of five to 10% per year through new products, price increases and upsell. In the latest half yearly result, earnings per share increased 12%. So it's running slightly ahead of track, but our thesis is largely unchanged from 12 months ago. And yet the share price has risen more than 60%. So it's clearly harvest time here. The fund has sold about half of its initial investment over the last two months, and it's now a 4% position in the fund. Look, this is a business we'd love to own more of again if the price falls, but we might actually end up owning less of it if it keeps on rallying. Let's quickly touch on two newer investments in the, in the international fund, both made in the second half of last year. We diverted a lot of staff resources last year into developing a deeper understanding of the global automotive supply chain. Now it's a cyclical sector and one that faces some serious structural concerns for many players as internal combustion engines shift to newer power sources like electric vehicles and potentially as human steered cars shift to driverless cars. And again, potentially as personal ownership shifts to on-demand services like Uber. But with great concern comes at least the potential for cheap enough stock prices. And the, the fund is currently in two investment positions in the space. 
Lee Corporation's main business is a seat maker for new cars globally. This industry is surprisingly oligopolistic in nature with only four players dominating globally. This part of the business will naturally ebb and flow cyclically, but it's, in, it's really important to note that it's agnostic to the type of power source the car use, whether it's driven by a person or a computer, or whether it's owned by an individual or, or as part of a fleet. The other part, the smaller part of Lee's business is electronics, and that actually stands to benefit from some of these changes affecting the industry. Management have really strong capital allocation credentials, and have, over the past eight or nine years, have actually bought back more than half of the equity base of the company. The other investment we've made in the space is a Canadian corp company called Linamar Corporation, which specialises in pumping out high precision metal parts uh, in extremely high volume at very low costs. Now, 60% of its business is automotive related. It sells things like camshafts and cylinder heads for automakers to, to put directly into new cars. And this part of the business does face both cyclical and structural threats. But there are some important offsets to note. Firstly, T1 suppliers like Linamar have been growing their market share as automakers outsource more and more of the process to the most efficient players, of which Linamar is one. So while internal combustion engine unit growth might peak soon, the phase-out process will run for decades and Linamar should continue growing market share, cushioning the impact. The company is also increasingly involved in new engines like hybrids and electric vehicles. And importantly, the company also has a very significant and attractive non-automotive business focused on industrial access and agriculture. This generates about 40% of earnings, and that piece of the pie is likely to grow over time. Now, we think we've been able to buy this stock very cheaply, less than six times earnings. And the last piece of the puzzle here, and perhaps the most important piece, is that Linamar is run by an excellent owner-manager family. It was founded by Frank Hassenfratz 50 years ago, and he's still in he heavily involved in the business today. I think he's 84 years old. And his daughter, Linda, has been running the company as CEO for 18 years now. Now, the upside thesis for us is that management will do a good job taking the cash that's been significant amounts of cash being generated from the existing business and investing it wisely in new opportunities. With that short summary, I'll pass the mic back to Steve. Thanks, Gareth. Before we move on to the Q&A, and don't forget you can add questions in the Q&A tab on your webinar there, so, so get started as I, I wrap things up here. But before we move on, I just wanted to touch on a, a refresher about our role in the investment universe. And I think this is quite important at difficult times like this. I've said ad nauseum over the past 10 years that we run concentrated portfolios and we tend to buy deeply unloved securities. You should expect the returns to be lumpy and for there to be periods of significant performance. Hopefully you've heard that many times. But over the past seven years, we were saying that, but we weren't really experiencing it. We had our disasters, particularly in the Australian fund, like Variety, Photon and Hughes Drilling, but they were offset by stocks that were performing exceptionally well at the same time. Now we're experiencing significant underperformance and we're feeling exactly what that means. There are things that we need to fix in this business. We've talked about a few of those things today. I think you, you should expect to see lower cash weightings in this portfolio over time. Less mistakes, uh, investments that go disastrously wrong, <laughs> and a better balance, particularly in the Australian fund, between those really deeply unloved securities and some good businesses that we think can compound our wealth over a long period of time. But even if we do our job perfectly, underperformance is going to happen with an investment strategy like this. We are focused on the things that we can control. The first of those is making sure that we have the right team. And there has been some turnover over the past few years and um, in a, a small team of analysts that can have a big impact. We lost Matt Ryan a few years ago from the Australian Fund, uh, more recently Kevin Rose from the international side of things and in a small team like ours, it, it makes an impact. We've recruited lots of new people over the past few years and they've made a significant amount of progress uh, coming up to speed with the way we want to pick stocks and the type of funds that we want to put together. Importantly, that is letting me spend more and more time on some of the bigger issues here, A, around staff development, but probably more important, the bigger portfolio issues. 
what is the right cash weighting? Where are the right places for us to be investing? What is the right balance here between illiquid stocks and better quality businesses? You can see there that the team has grown. We've got four new people that have joined in the past few years and they're making good progress and we're still hoping to fill one more seat on the international side of things as well. We need to plug those people into a process that is robust and replicable. Uh, when we started this business, most of the stock picking or the process was in my head and even with two people, it's, it's possible to work very closely on every stock together. But for me to do my job well at a high level, we need a process that people can execute on throughout the business. And we've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort over the past few years putting something together that we can teach people and that we can do on a stock by stock basis. You don't need to look at this slide in detail, but it's a summary of at a high level of what that process looks like in the business at the moment. The final really important ingredient to this business has been an investor base that are strongly aligned with our philosophy. We think we've done a really good job of that over the years and that investor base has been very supportive through this difficult time so far. But this period is going to test our resilience and it's going to test your resilience too. You need to make sure that you have the right weighting to our portfolios uh, in your portfolio and you need to make sure your expectations are appropriate. I'm a huge fan of index funds for that low risk uh, core part of your portfolio. And if you want it to be large blue chip stocks in your portfolio, I think that's a really sensible way to go about it. We have a role to your play in your portfolio, providing something different, investing in that unloved part of the market. Your expectations need to be realistic about where and when those returns are going to come. Finally, particularly with the, the listed vehicle with the Australian fund, uh, at the very least, it's important not to try and compound the pain. Uh, I, said, I said a few years ago, it is very difficult if you pay a huge premium to NTA to end up with outsized returns over time. You can compound that if you pay a premium to NTA and you sell at a discount. I think it's probably, as it is with picking stocks, it's too much to ask that people time the entry and time the exit perfectly. My general philosophy is you're best off just getting the weighting right and sticking with it. But uh, at the very least, you don't want to compound the negative impacts. So it's a really important period. Uh, you as a client and investor in our funds are very important to our ability to make calm and rational decisions through this difficult period and make sure that we are benefiting from the opportunities that it provides. We're going to move on now to Q&A. So I'll bring Alex back in. Uh, we've got a few questions in the list at all, but don't forget Sorry, a few questions in the list already. Don't forget you can add them and we'll try and work through as many as we can. Great. Thank you, Steve, Alex and Gareth for that presentation. And I hope everyone found that useful. So moving on to the Q&A. We have had a handful of questions regarding the FOR share price and the fall from its heights to where it is now. And hopefully Steve addressed a lot of that in the presentation itself, but if you have any further questions on that, please do email us at the usual forager address. Um, so the first question I'll read out on the list is from Damien, and he noted that there were very high distributions in um, the Australian fund FOR at the end of the FY18 financial year, and is asking, will forager be forecasting and communicating the, the upcoming distribution this year? That's a really important question and, and I need to reiterate here that this is a listed trust and it's quite different from your typical listed company. It is still the same as an unlisted trust and that means we have to distribute all of our realised profits for the year, which includes realised capital gains, dividends and less expenses. So you should expect when the performance is very good that the distributions are correspondingly going to be high and when the performance is not so good, the distributions are likely to be much lower. It is possible that we still realise gains in years where the performance is bad, but your expectation this year from both funds really should be for very low distributions, if any. Again, neither of these vehicles are yield investments. They are businesses where we are trying to compound wealth over a long period of time. We have to pay out the realised gains when we realise it, but they're going to be lumpy and they're going to be dependent on the investment returns from year to year. Thanks, Steve. Um, a question along a similar theme from Andrew. Are you using capital to pay distributions? Uh, hopefully I answered that one in the, the previous response. Again, it's realised capital gains that we distribute. So throughout the course of the year, if we sell an investment at a profit, 
uh, we have to distribute that out, net of any losses, of course. It, it is usually and has historically been in the form of discounted capital gains because we hold most of our investments for more than 12 months. So there's some tax benefits to that, but you should expect mostly capital as part of the distribution. But it's not us choosing to return capital to you. It is realised profits on investments that we've made. Thanks for that, Steve. Um, moving on to the next question. Uh, this one's from Yong Yi Li. Um, could you please comment on the prospects for Linamar with respect to the pros, proposed trade tariffs between Canada and the USA? And what do you think will be the impact on business performance? And further to that, um, she states, I'm aware that Linda Hassan Fratz has been going to Washington DC to lobby against these tariffs, given that the business is highly integrated in global supply chains. There are risks there and it was, and it was a heightened risk when we were looking at this stock and, and making our investment in the middle of last year. A lot of that's been resolved through the, the U, USMCA agreement, uh, which is the, the follow on from NAFTA. There are still some significant kinks in there around um, unfinished products. So a lot of finished products are able to cross borders uh, without being affected now because of the new agreement. There are some significant steel, steel as an input cost, for example. Um, my understanding, so a lot of that is getting, is getting taxed unusually. My understanding of this is that a lot of that incremental additional cost is falling to the automakers, the American automakers in the end. Um, so it's effectively a, a subsidy from the automakers to American steel makers. Uh, it is complicated. There are risks there. Uh, I, I don't have all the answers. Uh, we hope and expect them to iron out the significant differences over time. Uh, the American auto industry now would, would be lost without access to Mexican and Canadian um, su part supply. Uh, they need it to be competitive on the global scale. So we you know, unless Trump is committed to actually killing the automaking industry, which we don't think is going to happen over the long run, uh, we expect this sort of stuff to be ironed out over time or else the US will become less competitive versus the rest of the world. Great. Thank you, Gareth. So next question is from Tony. And Tony asks, with 50 stocks on the watch list, what will be the impetus to get the cash invested? You're, you've been talking to the fact you're underinvested, but it's hard to understand what will drive the change to get the funds invested other than a general market downturn. So we've actually seen that happen over the last couple of months. And a lot of times it doesn't actually take a broad based uh, decline in markets. Oftentimes these are individual stocks and they will experience not just market, but sector and stock specific issues over time. So we've had the opportunity on a couple, and I think over time, whichever way the market goes, I believe we'll have opportunities on more on that list. So our job at the moment is to look for those and obviously be continually adding stocks to that list. I think really importantly here, this gap between what people are willing to value a growth business at and what they value it at if it's not a growth business is creating very, very significant individual stock falls in, in share prices. You know, you've got a business like Experience Co where the core of it is a pretty reliable, predictable business that's gone from, we think it's going to grow and therefore we'll pay 40 times earnings to we think it's not and it's now eight. And that, that stock specific fall is, is creating opportunities for us. It is, and, and this is why we've got a long watch list, but the cash weighting is still high in the portfolio. It's a bit of a minefield out there in the Australian economy at the moment. We're seeing lots of businesses on the ASX there. You know, the retail food groups of the world that we've had a good look at, the share price is down well, more than 90% in that scenario, but we really think the business is genuinely challenged and it has a lot of debt. So we are not just blindly buying stocks that have fallen out of bed, perhaps something we've been a bit guilty of historically, but we're trying to be very selective about those opportunities as well. I think the other thing that you'll hopefully see more of over the next year is more of the car sales type opportunities. And I think if we can get, you know, that cash weighting down with some good quality businesses that are probably not the, 
the 15% hurdle rate of return that we might expect on something that's really beaten up, but a relatively safe 7 to 9% return, you'll see us deploy a bit more money into that part of the market as well. Great, thanks for that, um, Alex and Steve. So the next question is from Jay. Um, question, there is no shame in changing your mind and selling if the story changes. We never hear of these situations. Is that because they do not occur or you do not think that they are worth mentioning? Changing your mind sooner could have saved some of the big losers. I think that's a fair criticism. I do think we're getting better at it. There's probably a, quite a few examples over the past couple of years of stocks where we have changed our mind. 3P learning is one that we didn't lose a lot of money on, but where we think the investment case doesn't have as much upside as we used to think, and we've exited that. Uh, Technicolor, we lost money on, but we have exited that uh, investment as well because it wasn't working out as we'd hoped. We had plenty on the international side, Hornbach, Foxton's, uh, quite a few others. Some, some we lost money on, some was a multi-year process, but uh, we, we are trying to get better at it, I think. And a few more on the Australian side, things like um, Pacific Energy that we would have held uh, a year, a year and a half ago, and companies like Reckon, and both of those have turned out to be reasonable decisions at the time where we've changed uh, our view as the situation changed. GBST was a more recent unfortunate decision to part ways because the investment case wasn't going the way we wanted. It ended up getting taken over. But I think in general, you're right. If I look back over the past 10 years, I would say we've cost ourselves money on average by holding on to things where the investment case is not working out. We've also had a few examples of you know, extreme opportunities when those share prices have fallen significantly as well. So it's important not to just sell blindly in those situations, but to try and genuinely reassess the investment opportunity in front of you. Um, just one really quick point on that. We've had the whole team sitting around one desk and in one office for the past 18 months. You've seen in today's presentation, we own Auto Trader in the UK. We own car sales here in Australia, two very similar businesses where there's been a lot of cross-pollination. I think with a bit of team and a bit more separation um, between the, the person that you're discussing the idea with and the original idea generation, we'll hopefully get some more independent sounding boards around that stuff because I think psychologically, it is very, very, very difficult to do it yourself. Thanks everyone for your answers there. So the next question is one we received over email prior to the webinar. It's for the Australian Fund. Please provide an update on ISU, that's iSelect. I heard something negative yesterday regarding some ACCC action. Also, I noticed that Thorny is now on the register. Do you ever form a voting block to pressure the, bo pressure the board into a particular direction? I'm hoping ISU doesn't turn into another fig. I'll take that one, Alex. So on the, on the entry of Thorny onto the register, we, we're not in contact with them. We're obviously aware that they're on the register. Just uh, we do every once in a while, and especially in situations where there's potential activism opportunities, we'll converse with other shareholders to get their views on situations but that hasn't been the case at the moment. Uh, that action uh, from the ACCC, uh, it's focused around a sub-segment of their business, so the energy sub-segment, and it, it looks at quite specific issues. It sounds like it's the availability of particular deals, whether they are online or offline. I think it highlights that the business does need to continually improve the disclosure and in all our interactions with management, we've relayed to them that they should be going early with changes and they should be going above and beyond what they may have considered to be historical norms. Great, thanks for that, Alex. Next question comes in from Simon and it's about Nero. I gather that a price of two times turnover could be expected for takeovers of marketing companies. As Enero is already valued at that, do you expect them to grow further by acquisition or is it close to its peak already and therefore close to being sold by Forager? Uh, that question I think might be mixing up the half year and the full year revenue. Business is a bit more than 100 million of revenue and less than that in market cap and uh, you're right, they, they do trade at two times turnover but that would be a very significant premium to the current price there. We do think this business does need more scale though. So you know, it's a nine times earnings at the moment, it's paying a dividend, but for it to be a really successful business for us, we need them to keep executing on a little bit of organic growth and some successful acquisitions over time because you've seen the impact 
over the past year. The reason it's a lower revenue multiple than most of these businesses is because the overheads are chewing up more of the operating profit. If they can grow the business and keep the overheads at the same sort of level, we'll see a significant increase in profitability and therefore a, a market price that is more commensurate with typical marketing companies around the world. And we've noticed some of that operational leverage coming through already in the prior half. You had an organic revenue growth of something like 15%, but you had primarily because of those overheads being uh, up lower than the revenue growth, you've had earnings up more than 90% for that business. That's just in that half year. Okay, thanks for that, Alex and Steve. Um, I have a question from Darren next. So on the topic of the FOR distribution, he's asking, as a very rough estimate, what do you expect the distribution per share to be for the Oz Fund based on only current gains, realized dividends received, if there is any to date? And second part to his question, have you really jumped too quickly onto certain beaten down stocks in the past? I thought you did lots of research with lots of critical thought and analysis before buying anything. Um, just on the distribution, we will send out an email over the next couple of weeks with an estimate. There are a few moving parts around realising some of our failed investments from the past couple of years, but you should expect it to be very low, if anything at all. So when I say very low, I mean very low single digit percentages, if anything. But we'll send an email out in the next couple of weeks with an estimate for both funds of what the distribution will be at your end. Look, I hope I didn't uh, say that in a, in a flippant way. I just look at what we've done over the past and, and even businesses that have worked out very, very well for us like Jumbo. Now, our first purchase in that stock was north of $2 a share. We made all of the money buying it at 80 cents a share and it's now $17 or whatever the number is. Unfortunately, sold way too soon at our end. But the point is not that we're doing it without doing a lot of research. There's a lot of research and due diligence that goes into it. I think we've just historically underestimated how long and how much it takes to turn some of these businesses around and often the lack of incentive for management team and the board to do so. So this is particularly relevant as we've got bigger and we end up with these big stakes in companies that are, that are hard to get rid of. We just need to make sure that we're, we're being adequately compensated for that illiquidity. So we're waiting for a price that compensates for that and that we've got a clear plan for when and how we're going to start receiving cash from that investment. Thanks for that answer there, Steve. Um, moving on to the next question now. I don't think there's a name on this one. So question is, whilst, Forest, whilst Forager had set its direction as a value investor fund, it seems like the strategies being discussed are primarily price based, i.e. price differential between buy and sell, not so much on capital or revenue growth in underlying businesses. So not much different from most other investment funds. Is this just a mis misperception by me? Sorry, we're just deciding who should take that question. I think we are, uh, and you hopefully have seen it in particularly some of the international fund investments today, but also some of the, the Australian fund investments, we are very, very focused on growth as a part of our valuation equation. I do think at the moment, uh, this is true in Australia and it's true globally, there are there is a very, very strong focus from the market, from retail investors, from a lot of funds on those businesses that are able to grow and they are trading at commensurately high prices. So the constitution of the portfolios at the moment is probably more at the, the less growth end of the spectrum, but you know, we do like growing businesses. We do know how to value them and we do want to own them over time. We just don't want to pay a full price for them. Thanks for that, Stephen Gareth. And moving on to the next question, which is from Jane. So what is the latest on you wanting to change the fees on the international fund? I think Jane actually said on you wanting to increase the fees on the uh, And then she made a comment, should the fees change, not increase? Uh, we sent out a survey, I think it was just after Christmas, talking about a potential change here to a lower base fee and implementing a performance fee. 
we got a lot of feedback. Uh, we are working forward on doing something. A quick summary is probably that the, the performance fee will be lower than was suggested in the, the survey. Uh, we are looking to progress with it though, and you'll hear more over the coming weeks. Is that fair, Alex? Yes, weeks. Um, Great, thanks for that answer, Steve. Um, we've had a couple of people asking a similar question about share buybacks in FOR. Um, one from Simon and again from Jane. We got asked this question a lot at the listing, will you do a buyback if the, the units trade at a discount? Uh, I'll say categorically that we won't rule it out, but it is not something that we have been actively considering recently. We still think, we said this on day one, we still think the the most appropriate way to deal with it is to deal with the causes of it trading at a discount rather than trying to artificially stump up the price by buying back your own units. Um, there's not a huge amount of liquidity in the vehicle, so the ability for us to deploy significant amounts of our cash is, is very limited. We won't rule it out, but our focus is on those four things that I talked about before around trying to address that issue uh, rather than a buyback at the moment. Great, thanks for that, Steve. Just deciding on the next question. Um, so this one is from Simon and it's about Freedom Insurance. He's saying, what, if anything, do you expect to receive from the Freedom Insurance wind-up? So Simon, in, in short, not much. The company released something recently suggesting that it had sold uh, or transferred rather the administration and the the uh, uh, the required costs of that onto a third party, they should end up with a little over five million dollars from that whole uh, transaction. There will still be some costs that will need to be come out of, that will need to come out of that, and uh, they are still up for potential uh, penalties from uh, from ASIC. So we're not expecting dramatic. Uh, uh, return back from it in the unit price for FOR. They have for some time been held at zero. Great, thanks for that, Alex. Next question is from Peter. Um, can you please comment on the potential downside, downside risks to Blanco given the very high weighting in the fund? So this is, <clears throat> this is a small business. Its market capitalization is less than 100 million pounds. It is globally dominant, but it is, it is in a very small sector of the market. It has a fairly singular focus, or so that, that's probably widening. So small, illiquid, singular focus business, a lot can go wrong. This is, there's not a single business in the world that fits those three, three descriptions that does not face potential risks. Um, yeah, it's a 9.5% weighting. That's an unusually large weighting for us. We have... We have an unusually high degree of confidence in its ability, but there are some generic risks that go with the territory. Uh, if the new management team fails to execute on plans to, to return to, to revenue growth, if costs blow out and they're unable to get the margins up to where we think they should be, probably at 20 or more percent, um, and, and a variety of things around this. And there's also potentially reputational issues. If something about the product fails to work in a situation where it's supposed to, uh, and one of its customers goes through a, through a difficult time related to release of data that shouldn't have been released, uh, this could be a big issue for them. But I, I the, the chances of that happening, we think are very, very low. Two important additions here. I mean, I think our initial weighting in this stock was two and a half or three percent when the uncertainty was very, very high. A, about uh, the management team, B, the actual profitability of the business, and C, although we had a lot more confidence about this, the actual product itself. I think all three of those things, our certainty has increased dramatically over the past few years. So, yes, all of those risks are still there. We would assign a much lower probability to them today than they were. And secondly, and again, this goes back to the product here that we are offering for our clients. We want to run concentrated portfolios of our best ideas. And that's why it should be a relatively small percentage of your portfolio. 
but we should be prepared for significant periods of underperformance and potentially significant drawdowns if something like a Blanco doesn't work out. It's going to have a significant impact on our performance. On the other side of the equation, we want it to have a very significant impact on performance when, if, when it does work out as well. Thanks for that, Gareth and Steve. And we've got time for one more question, and this one is from David. Um, and it is, does Steve feel like he has sufficient time to devote to stock selection and portfolio management? Sometimes it appears he is busy in other roles. It's a good question, David. Uh, and I think it has been an issue to be fair over the past few years, particularly on the staff side of things. We've had to do a lot of recruitment and a lot of implementation uh, into the team. That is a pain today, hopefully for gain tomorrow issue for down the track, because it's really, really important that we build a business here that is not wholly and solely dependent on me. And that means attracting the right people and the right team and me extricating myself uh, fairly meaningfully from the actual stock research process so that I can run the portfolios and steer the team around to the areas that I think are, are most prospective. Uh, we've made a lot of progress on that, so hopefully you'll see um, more of my time devoted to those things over the next few years. It still has a ways to go, and, and uh, I'd like to think you're going to see the younger people in the business stepping up more over the coming years as well, but it's a very important, I think, ingredient to our long-term success here. We might just take this last one as well on the Asia So, sorry, one last question on the Asia strategy from George. He is asking, can you add some colour to your Asia strategy? Will you be looking on a stock-by-stock -stock basis or will wider themes be at play, e.g. Um, countries? I recall the Japan, in inverted commas, cigar butt exper experiment as an example. That's a great question. Uh, I wouldn't call it an Asia strategy to start with, and I think that's really important. We've tried to, well, we've specifically tried to recruit people that have different circles of competence from the team that's already here so that we don't have too much overlap. So I didn't particularly care whether that was US experience or it was Asian experience or it was Eastern European experience. I just wanted it to be different from the team that we've had. So we want this person to bring ideas to the team that are, that are coming from a different space from what we already have. And I think one of the issues that I've hopefully talked a bit about today is you know, Gareth and I, we feel comfortable, we have experience in Europe and the UK, and that's why you've seen a large part of the portfolio exposed there. I think that can deliver us perfectly adequate returns, but it has been a very narrow focus that has been detrimental to the fund's performance over a long period of time. We want to broaden that out. Now with Paul, don't expect it to be exclusively Asian ideas or exclusively one country. He you know, has experience in other places and he wants that flexibility to pick stocks from all around the world. Most of his experience is in Asia. That's going to help us when we've got ideas there. You know, I might have an idea or Gareth's got an idea that's got an Asian element to it. He can chip in on that and use his experience to help it. And we can help him vice versa uh, on stocks in other parts of the world as well. So don't expect it to be a, we're now going to allocate 30% of the portfolio to this part of the world. You should just expect more of the ideas are similar to what we've done historically, but potentially listed in those parts of the world. Um, we've said last question three times, but hopefully this, this is, really is the last question. So this one is from Pete. Do you set yourselves a stop loss on the downside or does the company investment strategy have to change before you exit as, at a loss? How much downside is tolerable whilst waiting for a company to meet your expectations and increase to a profit for FOR? That's the Australian fund. Yeah, the theory here is we're constantly trying to assess price and value and I'll reiterate this, our most successful investments over the past 10 years have been stocks that more than halve from the first purchase when we bought them. Both Service Stream and Jumbo Interactive are in that category. Uh, in those cases, we made the right decision to commit more money to them at very, very attractive prices. In some cases, we've made the wrong decision and we need to get that part of the process right more often than not. I think blindly selling stocks just because the share price is down is an almost uh, certain way to detract from your returns over a long period of time. And particularly, you know, the fund's 150 million now, there's often not even the liquidity to do that if we wanted to do it in a hurry. 
Great, thanks for that, Steve. And I think that's all we had time for today. So thank you everyone for listening and thanks for sending in your questions. And I hope you found the pres presentation today informative and useful. And as always, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to email us at admin at foragerfunds.com or call the office on 02 6050.